Vast tracts of grassland and savanna are on almost every continent. Ranging across this open, horizontal world are the planet's largest concentrations of herd animals. They run on hooves, eat grass, and move in enormous groups. And this draws the interest and appetite of some of the most powerful hunters on Earth. Herds and hunters. This timeless struggle ushers in some of nature's most dramatic encounters. Wildebeest versus lion. Bison against bison. Herds building fortresses underground. Hunters descending from the sky. And the ultimate moment between the savannah's fastest competitors. These are moments of wonder. Just seeing them is a miracle. Capturing them on film, often impossible. Too fast to keep up with cheetah. Too sudden to track raptors. Lions lost in the savannah's omnipresent grass. But if we could capture this stop time drama, the secrets of one of nature's consummate encounters can emerge. Chief among the life and death moments on the African Serengeti are the ones that unfold between the great herds of migrating wildebeest, more than a million strong, and the prides of lions that live along the way. With few places to hide in an open landscape, constant threat of attack by masters of stealth, cunning, and speed. Traveling by herd boosts the odds of survival. It's a cruel calculation. A herd presents a larger, more obvious target. But the risk on any individual wildebeest is reduced. Of course, it's inevitable that some will fall prey. Wildebeest. Lion. The contest seems mismatched. Yet with so many variables, the outcome is never certain. It all comes down to a game of inches. Actually, about 50 yards. The critical distance where a wildebeest speed often gets the better of the big cat's enormous powers of acceleration. Of these opponents, the wildebeest doesn't look like much of an adversary. But there's more to this unlikely champion than meets the eye. Body mass is concentrated high and forward. Ideal for cantering hundreds of miles. And those spindly legs? Lower legs are lightweight. Upper legs, packed with muscle tucked close to the body, are capable of bursts of speed as fast as 40 miles per hour. Down in the hooves, a scent gland helps one wildebeest follow the next, despite dust or dark of night. This is a body built to be on the move, because every day 
is a race for life. Relying on eyesight many times more acute than a human's, a lion surveys the herd. But the wildebeest are on the lookout as well. So much so that only about one in seven lion attacks succeed. At signs of danger, the herd will bolt. Or sometimes they'll bunch together, keeping calves hidden. Even confronting a solitary lion head on. For the wildebeest, the grass is life. But it's also cover for the enemy. This lion, hidden in the grass, senses an opportunity. A mother and calf have strayed from the herd. When she goes, a lion's acceleration can cover 50 feet in less than two seconds. But in this moment, something surprising occurs. The lioness turns away from the calf, the easier kill, and makes an attempt for the larger adult. Why she does has everything to do with where these rivals were just seconds before. Having penetrated so far inside the wildebeest's escape zone, perhaps the lioness feels she now has a chance at running down the bigger meal. And unlike the wildebeest's long and lean lower limbs, the lions are short and heavily muscled. It's like a matchup between a marathon runner built for endurance and a sprinter with a weightlifter's strength. The lion's charge zeroes in on the wildebeest's vulnerable flanks. Then there's the leap. Cats can rotate their wrists, wrap their paws around prey, and unleash jackknife-like claws to hold on. Though the wildebeest outweighs the lioness, it isn't designed for side-to-side -side stability. A lion's powerful shoulders and momentum can knock it over. Once it's down, the lion's toolbox of teeth go to work. To seize the throat or to clamp over a muzzle, Long canines bite like daggers, killing by suffocation. Later on, upper and lower carnassial teeth work like scissors to slice meat. Even the surface of the tongue has sharp, pointed bumps for rasping flesh from the kill. In the moment, one wildebeest, one lion. But in the bigger picture, it's the grassland's quintessential balancing act. Small bands of hunters picking their opportunities within the migrating herds. Any moment of impact turns on split-second timing. Luck. And millions of years of physiological adaptation. It's hard to imagine another animal with superpowers like the King of Beasts. Speed. Strength. Jaws and claws. But there's one that has all these. And it can fly.
With a seven foot wingspan, the Golden Eagle is one of the largest, perhaps most ferocious of all birds of prey. They're called raptors because their most distinctive feature is seizing and killing prey with their talon-tipped feet. This aerial hunter patrols an area in excess of 15 square miles. And they can dive nearly 200 miles per hour. They could take prey as large as deer. But the golden eagle subsists primarily on hare, ground squirrels, and in the prairie lands, jackrabbit. Outstretched claws rocket in, like bullets from above. Their quarry is stranded, racing about on the ground, desperate for an escape. Yet for all their weaponry, technique, and talent, eagles don't always win. Even so outgunned, a rabbit can survive an eagle's airborne assault. To understand this split-second reprieve, a case when the hunter is upended by the game, we need to retrace the moment to its beginnings. When the eagle was flying high, using its broad wings to catch the thermal currents. An eagle's wing bones are actually hollow, keeping them light. Most of the bird's weight and power are in the flight muscles in the chest. And deep within, a tiny wishbone absorbs the strain of its powerful flapping wings. These wings are ideal for soaring. But compared to the high-speed wings of other raptors, like falcons, an eagle's broad wings have a harder time making extremely tight turns something jackrabbits do exceedingly well. But these birds can see a rabbit twitch from hundreds of feet away. They're famous for their eagle eyes, orbs larger than their brains, delivering an image three times sharper than a human's. Once a target is spotted, the hunter starts its dive. But a jackrabbit doesn't give up easy. Its powerful hind legs can propel it along at more than 40 miles per hour. Adaptations in its skull help it keep a level head despite the frantic pace. The rabbit skull is built on a shock-absorbing joint to help stabilize vision during leaps and bounds at top speed. The wingtips of the eagle look ragged, but they're actually separate feathers, like splayed fingers, individual winglets for better lift and to keep the bird from stalling as it's breaking. No airplane can do all this. And yet, something has gone wrong. For the eagle, that is. The rabbit stops abruptly. and the eagle overflies its mark.
like a fish out of water, an eagle forced to walk has lost its chance to snare this prey. For all their amazing weaponry, hunters are only successful a percentage of the time. For every tooth, venom, and claw in a predator's arsenal, prey animals have defensive weapons of their own. But what happens when an animal's worst enemy is one of its own kind? Late summer in America's prairie lands. Days are growing shorter. Mating season among the bison is approaching. A time when males in the herd turn on each other. It's known as the rut. Bulls will stage aggressive displays to compete for females. But then it escalates. Dominant bulls will face a succession of challengers, each bent on supplanting his access to bison cows. When bison meets bison, it's a moment of pure impact. How are the bodies of North America's biggest brute engineered from within to dish out maximum force? From their earliest days, they're born with bison attitude. Even before they've grown the beef to back it up. But within just a few years, they'll weigh in at more than 2,000 pounds. With this much body armor, they're ready for a rumble. When the moment of impact comes, everything hinges on the extraordinary construction inside. A massive shoulder girdle of bone is built to maximize forward momentum. Enormous vertebrae fortify the trademark hump. A helmet of hair and hide, several inches thick, covers a rock-hard skull. This is some of the densest protective padding in nature. And topping it off, hard-wearing horns up to a foot long and deadly sharp. As the battle rages, androgen hormones are coursing through these bulls at double the levels, reducing their sensitivity to pain. One of the challengers is backing off and finally gives up. Animals with a rutting season knock heads just once a year. For another, head banging is a way of life. It's one of the most familiar sounds. A creature finding a way to amplify its presence way beyond its size. But how on earth does this bird's brain withstand the punishment? Up to 20 times each second, face first, and every time woodpecker meets wood, the force is 20 times a boxer's knockout punch. Woodpeckers are equipped with strong bills to chisel out a nesting hollow, to probe for bugs, and to drum out a mating call. 
but for this moment after moment of impact. The durability of the exterior hardware owes everything to the operating system inside. A millisecond before each strike, muscles behind the beak contract to divert the impact on the brain. The bird's extra long tongue retracts within and wraps around the skull. In some species, an inner eyelid closes to protect the eyeball from flying splinters. The biomechanics that allow these hard-hitting birds to safely drill and drum are remarkably complex. But the payoff, quite simple. Excavating a hole to build a nest keeps the offspring safe. Whether it's hatchlings in a nest or pups in a burrow, in the natural world, these places are often a target. Sometimes by very formidable predators. But at the moment of impact, even small prey, armed with secret powers, are willing to face off against a dangerous enemy. Just a flick of the tail and the sound of the rattle are usually enough to provoke fear among most of us. The moment is primal. An encounter with one of nature's most efficient and specialized predators, rattlesnakes. Forked tongue. Highly venomous. Deadly. In the heat of the late afternoon, a rattler is on the move and hungry. In these northern California grasslands, ground squirrel is one of the preferred prey. You wouldn't think that this would be much of a contest at all. Think again. It may look foolhardy, but the common ground squirrel has evolved superpower defenses to protect the colony at this moment of danger. The heart of the squirrel's strategy is deception, looking and behaving like something else. And why it works has everything to do with how its opponent sees the world. A distinguishing trait shared by a group of venomous vipers around the world is the heat-detecting organ located on the sides of their heads. They're known as the L'Oreal Pits, external openings to a pair of extremely sensitive heat registers that help the snake judge the location and the size of warm-blooded prey. Working like a pair of rudimentary eyes, heat pits enable a snake to discern something warmer by only three thousandths of a degree from the surrounding temperature. But somehow, the squirrels have learned all this. Or at least enough to know how to use the rattler's own heat detection against it. Faced with a rattlesnake, a squirrel begins frantically flicking its tail. This isn't panic. It's actually flooding the tail with blood, making it nearly as hot as the rest of its body to increase the size of its own heat profile. The snake is thrown on the defensive. Other squirrels join in, chirping out alarm calls to warn the rest of the colony. Adult squirrels can risk being quite bold. Even if they get bit, enzymes in their blood render the venom less toxic.
The real danger is to the squirrel pups, still vulnerable to the rattler's venom. And the rattlers seem to know this, as they search the colony for entrances to burrows. The rattler is like a heat-seeking missile headed straight for the den. This is a moment no parent wants to face. But it's the moment of truth. The mother squirrel goes into action to repel the invader. The snake is risking burial under the dirt. Finally, it retreats. In the long drawn out battle between predator and prey, offensive weapons often give rise to countermeasures. Rattlesnake and squirrel are in the midst of an evolutionary arms race, millions of years in the making. Yet every time these two come face to face, it comes down to survival. Every grassland encounter is so one on one. Every so often, a herd stands together against a threat. Sometimes it takes an entire army responding as one at a moment's notice against an invader. With termites, the idea of a herd goes to a new level, forming super colonies capable of supersized fortresses, like castles that can rise over 20 feet in height. The termite mound creates a safe zone in the midst of the open grasslands. A humid microclimate sheltered from the drying effects of the African sun. The key to the health of the nest is engineering that captures wind to circulate air through the mound. Inside is a multi-story home suitable for a family of four million. It comes with roomy chambers for egg laying, nurseries, fungus farming, the accommodations are extensive, but this is no paradise. Not when intruders drop by so frequently. It's not surprising that so many animals have evolved a taste for termite. They're abundant. Planet-wide, ants and termites make up 20% of animal life. as a source of food, they contain more protein than steak. The real question is, how do the termites survive all the attention? They have a secret weapon. And she has superpowers. Buried deep below the mound is the termite queen. With her enormous pulsating body, she's laying an egg every three seconds, 30,000 in a day. She's also secreting a pheromone that stimulates her blind workers to catch her eggs like midwives and carry them to the nursery. Protecting the queen is the job of soldier termites.
when a moment of invasion occurs, they are ready to defend the mound. And their enemies range from ants to ant-eating predators. It looks like a strange pine cone come to life. The scaly pangolin is rarely seen, emerging only at night and with a powerful appetite for termite. Hunting by smell, it's found a termite mound and digs in. But it really makes headway with one of nature's more bizarre utensils. The pangolin can extend a tongue 16 inches in length. And as it probes, it's covered in a sticky termite-catching slime. Soldier termites fight back, using razor-sharp jaws to bite and tear at the intruder. The invasion may have accounted for losses in the thousands. But with the queen's prodigious egg-making, That'll be made up in less than a day. She ensures that this underground herd will endure, relatively safe, for decades. Far different are conditions for prey animals on the open savanna. Often a place of vigilance. where constant attention, in a heartbeat, turns to adrenaline. And nowhere are things more risky than at a water hole. While these hazards have become iconic, for one animal, the challenge goes well beyond predator prey. With the simple act of taking a drink of water, the giraffe's very body plan is put to the test. And the problem isn't just confined to its awkwardly bending knees. When a neck is this long, some remarkable advances are required internally. Powering this neck is the most forceful blood pressure in the animal kingdom. Its heart, 40 times bigger than a human's, pumps 16 gallons a minute to traverse nine feet of giraffe from heart to head. But if this much blood is pumping at the moment they bend down to take a drink, why don't they get dizzy, as we would, when they lift their heads to the sky? Inside a giraffe's neck, a complicated series of vascular valves increase blood pressure to the rising head. Even the veins contain muscles to regulate blood flow, keeping these giants from getting lightheaded. Luckily, they only need to drink every few days, getting most of their water from the 75 pounds of vegetation they typically eat each day. And of course, no other animal is so well suited for taking advantage of the savannah's trees. In the midst of the dry season, new shoots are still sprouting in the crown of the acacia tree. A high protein meal only available to the world's tallest animal. Males can reach 18 feet in height. Complementing its long neck is its elongated prehensile tongue. As handy as fingers, it can strip leaves while avoiding the acacia's sharp spines. For all the well-known advantages of this animal's size, a hidden cost 
is the impact on the youngest members of the species. Nurtured for nearly 15 months in the protected environment within its mother, this giraffe is about to enter the world. It's already 150 pounds and six feet tall. This giraffe mother is ready to give birth, something they accomplish standing up. From a height of six feet, a newborn giraffe's first journey is quite a drop. The newborn calf can barely control its long limbs, let alone stand. Unlike wildebeests, giraffe mothers and their newborns don't immediately rejoin a herd. In such a feeble state, it's extremely vulnerable. So the mother rarely strays too far. For all their slow-moving elegance, when protecting their young, Giraffes can be fierce adversaries. Here, three lions have stolen a baby giraffe. The mother is trying to beat them back. A giraffe's front legs are longer than the back ones, and they are surprisingly robust, capable of delivering a lethal blow. It is rare that lions will brave an attack on a full-grown giraffe. The lions have done most of the damage, but in the heat of the moment, she may have trampled her own calf. Realizing the baby is dead, she reluctantly yields this battleground for the lions to scavenge. More than half of all giraffe calves fall prey, typically to lions or hyenas. As elsewhere on the savanna, birth and death are close companions, tipping one way or another in a moment's time. Every animal on the planet grows into its body. Some faster than others. But no one comes into this world fully formed. It can take some time to learn how to use the equipment. And when we need it in the moment, we better be ready. Imagine what it's like growing into one of the biggest bodies on Earth. All young elephants must face a crucial early test. They actually have to learn to use their trunks, the remarkable organ on which their lives depend. An elephant's trunk is a hand, a nose, a telescoping probe. It's a forklift that's been used for hard labor. It's the only utensil they need for putting food in their mouths. And in the water, it's a cannon, a snorkel, a straw, 
A baby elephant nurses from its mother with its mouth. This calf is trying to drink water the same way. A young elephant can get pretty frustrated trying to get momentum into its dangling appendage. Like human tongues and octopus arms, a trunk is a pressurized system with thousands of muscles along the length and radiating around the nostrils, enabling such fine coordination that the tip can pick up a coin. Once they learn, everything an elephant eats and drinks will be put into its mouth with the trunk and the skill with which they use it can at certain moments turn into an instrument for some sort of higher intelligence when they're touching the bones of their dead. For an animal so well known for its size, vital to the design is perhaps the most versatile tool in the animal kingdom. One by one, we've seen the quintessential encounters of the grasslands. Displays of stealth, power, strength in numbers, grace in motion. Yet the open savanna has shaped animals in yet another way. Bone, tendon, muscle and nerves have all been honed in the service of speed. The result, the ultimate moment of herd and hunter, is between the cheetah and varieties of gazelle. How these biomechanical missiles compete seems to push the very envelope of what an animal body can do. When these two ancient adversaries face off, success or failure often comes down to which one is in top form and a bit of luck. First, the cheetah. At a dead run, they may be able to sprint nearly 70 miles per hour, the fastest mammal on Earth. This is a cat with a greyhound chassis light boned and sway back, long legs for drive, long tail for balance, short aerodynamic head. Their acceleration is so quick, shifting to maximum speed in seconds, only high speed photography can catch the details. Cheetahs are rocket fast. They have to be. So is their prey. Gazelle. The short grass plains in which these antelope range make their herds quite visible. Tommies and Springbok are sociable and gregarious their herds open and fluid. They aren't quite as fast as the cheetah, but their advantages are quick turns and distance. They can maintain a run with stamina far outlasting the sprinting cat. When galloping, the gazelle's gut can pump like a high performance piston, maximizing oxygen intake. Besides their impressive endurance, Springbok have a style of running all their own. Sudden leaps, called pronking, 
may show off their strength and fitness. But survival depends on vigilance. Knowing where the hunters are and getting away in time. The cheetah doesn't make it easy. With their speed, they don't need to get as close as lions to launch an attack. And since lions often hunt at night, cheetahs work primarily on the day shift. Their spotted coat helps them hide in the grass. This is a highly visual hunter. Black shading under each eye cuts glare. Large forward-facing eyes provide color vision. And within the eye, a specialized band of nerve cells increase their powers to focus on prey moving across the landscape. Unlike lions that often target old or sick individuals, cheetah go after healthy gazelles, usually ones that have moved away from the herd. The cheetah starts running. But how does it build up so much speed? The cheetah's hip and shoulder girdle can swivel on a flexible and elongated spine that coils and uncoils with every bound. In super slow motion, we can see that the cheetah goes airborne, covering more than 20 feet in a single stride. Its spine curves backward in the extreme, while ligaments at the bottom and top of the spine stretch and snap back in effect, shooting the cat forward. With hair trigger responses, this antelope attempts its escape. Though it is slower, it can outcorner the cat. But the cheetah's long tail acts as a rudder, helping it handle the tight turns. Even while moving so fast, a cheetah can extend one paw to trip up its prey. And when it knocks it down, it lunges for the throat with its short jaw and small blunt canines, grasping the windpipe and dispatching it by suffocation. Today, this cheetah has been lucky. And though this one gazelle has met its match, the rest of the herd, by force of numbers, lives on. Despite its reputation, not everything on the savanna is always so tooth and claw. Not every second, so adrenaline filled. Most of the day passes unexceptionally. But every now and then, there's a moment. Often the split second between life and death. When creatures are tested to their core, survival is never secure. As conditions change, Nature finds new ways to adapt the equipment. Now, we're beginning to keep up with it.
going inside the moment with these creatures to finally see the genius within.